We would get intermediate uh, mortar fire, just more or less harassment fire, ever now and then on the fire base uh, harassment. Uh, a small NVA squad, mortar squad, would lob two or three rounds up and try to do some damage, and then they'd disappear before we could had time to direct any artillery in on them or anything like that. But the, the first CA combat assault I was in was about a month after I'd been in with the company, and that was from Firebase 6 over to a hill complex to our west, uh, Hill 990. And uh, initially, the first day, when we told it, we were told it would be a big operation and there would be casualties, but that first day, we got in there, started setting up our perimeter and so forth. There was another squad or two to our west was making a sweep around the hill. And it wasn't a steep hill. It was just a gradual tapering out, more or less, for a ways at least. And then it went down into the different valleys and other hills or whatever. But anyway, uh, they started taking sniper fire. And they had two. we had two guys wounded in the legs. And... I was sent out with three others to make uh, uh, temporary litters to bring them back into the perimeter. And then I went back out because this was my first experience and I wanted to learn as much as I could. So anyway, we, f we captured the sniper and it was the weirdest thing. It was like out to the front of where we were taking fire, we were behind this little knoll, I guess, and it was flat ground for some distance out, and then the jungle started again. All there was out there in the middle of this flat area was this little bush, probably about three feet wide, maybe two feet high, and the sniper was in the dugout hole behind that, had steps and everything, but the odd thing was, it. I don't think he was an NVA soldier. I think he was a mountain yard, an old mountain yard guy. And I looked at him after we captured him, and I said to myself, is this the enemy? And I think it was what the NVA and the VC would do from time to time. They'd take a head man in a village or some pr prominent mountain yard guy, tell him that they needed to do this or they would kill his family which they did, and that's what he looked like. He had a little loincloth on, nothing else on, and he had this old antiquated French rifle that he was shooting. If he'd have been a real sniper, he would have gone for a chest or a head shot. This guy went for a leg shot on both soldiers. Now, I can't prove any of that, but I would swear that he was an old mountain yard guy forced to do it. So that, that Hill 990, that's the first time you really started to meet the enemy? Yes, that was our uh, first combat assault that I was in. And to continue, I almost forgot. All night long, uh, there was a flare plane that circled overhead. You could hear the drone of it all, day, all night long. And it would drop these, I forget how, what candle power they are, I just can't remember. But they'd drop these flares and they would swing below their parachute back and forth as they slowly went to the ground. And before the, the, the one hit the ground, another one would be dropped. And so it was illuminated all night long and it was the eeriest light, the gray, silvery light. And, Everything in the jungle that could cast a shadow seemed to be alive. Different levels of the ground, bushes, trees, you name it, it was just all moving. And I, I stayed on guard duty till the wee hours of the morning, and I was relieved and told to get some sleep, and nothing happened. But the next day, and I think it was because we'd been so active that day and all night on some kind of... Uh, uh, what's, what's that called? Uh, alert to what level I don't remember, but right across the valley to our south, and no more than a 
mile away, it was the crow flies, there was Firebase 29. And that next morning, we were all shuttled by Huey to Firebase 29. The company over there was shuttled back into Hill 990, a fresh company. And I, on, on 29, where our bunker was, you could see right across there, almost straight line that appeared to be across to Hill 990. And I, we were told that we, there'd be another, uh, uh, what was the word I just used there? Um, you stay alert, on an alert of some kind that night too. So I volunteered to ask my uh, squad leader if I could stay up all night because something was in the air. You could sense it. And I wanted to be ready for it. And he said, yeah, as long as I, you know, made sure if I got sleepy, I woke somebody up. So anyway, right after it got really dark, the ground attack started on Hill 990. Why they didn't do it the night before, I don't know. But anyway, um, and it was an amazing thing to watch. You know, the, the firepower that an infantry rifle company can put out is just, and sustain is amazing. And we didn't use tracers, but they did. And theirs were kind of a greenish uh, tint to them or light lime green color. But anyway, shortly after that started, our artillery support for that unit on Hill 990 started coming in, and it was wherever it was, I'm not quite sure, coming over my head all night long. And it was like you could almost, I'm not exaggerating, it was almost like you could throw my helmet up and hit the shell. And it was, the trajectory was so low when it was coming over 29 and it was slowing down. You could hear, you know, the wobble, like a whoosh, whoosh. If you ever seen a, a quarterback throw a, a perfect spiral and if it goes far enough, it starts to slow down, it'll start to do that wobble. That's what these shells were doing. And I started counting seconds till they, I saw the explosion, and then a few a second or so later, whatever it was, I don't remember, you would hear the explosion, you know, and you knew how far away 990 was from where I was. But it was quite a sight to see. And then just before, just as it started to get light in the east that morning, the ground attack stopped, and it just faded away to, you know, quiet. And then later on that there was a lot of young soldiers were killed or wounded that during that attack. But uh, they were withdrawn and taken back to Docto or wherever it was. And that's the way Vietnam was, you know, just the body count. The ground you fought over obviously meant nothing to higher ups. Generals, they meant a lot to us because we shed blood there. But uh, that's the way Vietnam was, and then, and our people was removed. And what the NVA didn't carry off of their dead or wounded prior to daylight, they were left there to rot. Is that how the NVA would attack? They would come at night and kind of amass? Uh... Either that or it would be an uh, ambush in the jungle usually when uh, try to hit a patrol, slow them down, whatever it was, and then run off, disappear. Or it would be a concerted uh, uh, ambush where they dedicated to really trying to wipe you out. And they wouldn't do that or the ground attack Unless they had you outnumbered like four or five to one, that's when they when they do that. Uh, there were also the the mortar and artillery attacks, which would come from either around your area or off from in a distance and so forth. Do uh, any of those patrols or uh, attacks stand out in your mind as being particularly? Yes. Uh, they were all important when you're being shot at. Everything's important, you know, from your point of view. 
but there are there are two that stand out to me. One very early on during my tour of duty, and one at the very end that really stand out. One was I'd been in company about three months, three and a half months, and uh, this was a totally screwed up mission. Even and I didn't learn about all this until years later at a reunion. Even some of the lieutenants back at base camp tried to argue against this. But we were on Firebase 15, and our orders came down that one of the platoons in the company, and there was about 90 of us at any given time, give or take a little bit. There was four platoons in the company plus a CP group or the command post group. And three platoons were supposed to march out to this certain hill. And it, when they got out there, uh, it was just, there was high ground around, which is a no-no. And the hill only had bamboo on it. So the significance of that was that, but before I get there, two platoons were hit, were told to go up the hill, set up a perimeter. The other platoon was told to stay at the bottom of the hill, split up into four squads, about five guys each, at the different compass points around the base of the hill. That, to begin with, was absolutely ridiculous because we had no way of, uh, it took all the artillery support that we could have had at, at, during the night, and I won't get into the specifics of calling that in and everything, but that eliminated, eliminated any artillery support we might have been able to use. So the two platoons that got to the top of the hill set up their perimeter, and when we do that, we dig what we called fighting holes. And oddly enough, they were looked like kind of the approximate size of your average grave would be. But then you'd take sandbags we carried, fill them with the excavated dirt, and put about nine on each side, cut about three or four um, saplings from the jungle, trees, lay that across, and then put another th two or three layers of sandbags on top of that. They weren't so much fighting from, they were f for more or less getting into for protection in case of mortar or an artillery attack. Well, we couldn't do that because all they had was was bamboo. And it wouldn't support the sandbags. So our company commander at the time, which was Lieutenant Hadley, first lieutenant, we, and everybody from the rank and file told our squad leaders, the squad leaders told the two platoon lieutenants, the two platoon lieutenants told uh, Lieutenant Hadley that this was a bad spot. And he called our, the colonel base camp and asked for permission since it was early in the afternoon if we could move to a different location and get to some higher ground. And he explained to him why, why his reasons for that. They, he was told to shut up, follow orders, and it was to stay on the hill. Well, just before sunset, in about 15 or 20 minutes, we started taking mortar and what we thought was 75 millimeter recoilless rifle fire. We lost 13 guys killed outright in that amount of time that night. One, a uh, spec four brown died the next day before we could get him evacuated of his wounds and there was approximately 14 other others in the two platoons that were wounded two of my friends and one in my squad w was severely wounded and another one had a sucking chest wound we had we were ordered off the hill in the middle of the night after this had happened told to leave our dead, which didn't set well with any of us. They were all double-checked to make sure they were dead. And then we were ordered off the hill, down the hill, doing all this through the jungle in the middle of the night and so forth. And the enemy were coming up the other side of the hill. We could hear them in the underbrush and stuff. 
So finally, we, everybody got evacuated uh, by the next late morning, early afternoon, I forget which, and it, it was a total debacle. And you talk about some bitter, angry soldiers, I tell you, we were, and the morale in the company just went through the floor. But uh, it was, I have to say, it was, it was one of a kind. It never happened again, but uh, it shouldn't have happened in the first place. You just didn't make mistakes in Vietnam. The second occurrence was I had just come back from R&R. &R. The company had moved, of course, and Captain Androsky, oh, Lieutenant Hadley was killed that, that night. He was one of the dead. But And then our next company commander was Captain Donald Androsky, and I'd like to say some more about him later if I could. Um, we were told that there would be a big push, Operation Wayne Gray, into the lower part of the Play Trap Valley and a, at an old, an old uh, disassembled, abandoned fire base from U.S. troops in 67, I think, called the uh, LZ Swinger. And that was going to occur the next morning. And my new squad leader had told me that uh, th th there was a lot of enemy activity in the area, but they thought that LZ was be cold. And I only had about a little over a month left in country at the time. I said, blank, blank. I said, if you believe that, then you need to be here a little longer. So anyway, he said, oh, don't worry. And then, so the guys in the squad that night started asking me, say, why are you so worried about this? Everything will be cool. So I started telling them, they just got done telling us it was supposed to be a cold LZ and there's a lot of enemy activity in the area. Do those two things mesh up with you? And then I said, they also got done telling us it would be about f no more than five, four or five of us each to each to ever Huey. I said, it's going to take us longer to get on the ground and get a perimeter set up. And I said, if it's hot, try to imagine what that's going to be like. And they joked and laughed. And the one that was really gung-ho, he was a new guy. And it's, I'm sure he'd have been a nice soldier. Uh, he seemed like a really nice guy. His name was Markovic. He was the only one we lost that day. And nobody knew it at the time but he only had about 12 hours to live, and that's the way it was. It could have been you, it could be the other guy, and you lived with that. And every time you went into an LZ, it's the same gut-wrenching anxiety, apprehension, nerves. It's just like somebody taking your innards and just wringing them out like a wet voice cloth. And but you just learn to deal with it, and getting desensitized was a help. But anyway, when we got into the hill that day, we stopped at a little uh, resupply depot called Polycline, and this was it had an airstrip and so forth. And we went into the hill, and the NVA were on the hill to a point not a lot, there's about a platoon there. I don't know how many might have been around the hill, but anyway, they had some almost ground level bunkers built and they were in these bunkers and they had the LZ that we were going into booby trapped with a Claymore type uh, command detonated explosives tr to try to disable a, a Huey to clog up the, the uh, LZ, but we had a alternative LZ which we could have used, and the, but the, they weren't able to do that. But they, uh, after we the fight was over that day, we had killed 30 NVA. We would lost one guy, and I only saw like three wounded soldiers get on Hueys after the fight was over. And I thought that's all we lost for years until my first. 
uh, reunion. But what happened was we had about 14 wounded, all told. And on two of the helicopters that came in, in that first group of five or six, I was on the last one and with, with just three other guys. Two of them were new guys. But anyway, they NVA detonated those um, uh, booby traps, and they wounded the guys in the helicopters before they could dismount, and they f flew off back to Polly Klein. And then I didn't know until the 2018 reunion, but we'd lost a door gunner that day too. I, I felt bad about that, but I just never knew about it. And uh, the fight went on for, I think, three or four hours. And at one point, we were surrounded and outnumbered. And that last Huey that came in on, I when I got to this old, uh, what was left of a bunker, just a f squared off kind of foxhole thing, I noticed that all the helicopters had banked right and were headed it back in the direction of Polly Klein and I assumed I'd never seen anything like that before with the rest of our people didn't come in but I assumed it was just from the heavy fire and they'd been driven off and I I never thought a thing about it or worried about it until later in the afternoon I, I, I knew our people knew we were there knew we were in a pinch and they'd be back and then about just before the fight ended I started thinking, well, I hope somebody does something pretty quick because it's going to be a long night if nobody gets in here, depending on your point of view. And a little bit later, I saw the rest of our guys and uh, different sorties and uh, Hueys coming back in. And shortly after that, we secured the hill. After the battle, I was going to some NVA soldiers' belongings and their clothes and their dead ones. And in one breast pocket, there was a, a piece of plastic folded up, and inside the plastic was a like a legal piece of paper, yellow with the blue lines. Inside that was a picture, of, a black and white picture, wallet size, of an NVA lady, a young girl, and she had a little, uh, probably a year old girl on her, her hips, straddled on her hip. And I assumed that was this guy's wife. And it gave me a whole different perspective on things. Prior to that, they had just been enemy soldiers. They were there to kill us. We were there to kill them. But it gave me a whole new outlook on that. <clears throat> this guy was somebody's son, daughter, I mean, son, nephew, husband, whatever the case might be. It didn't change anything. I would have still done my job, but that's just a different look different thing you think about and anyway there was this other guy in our company by the name of Johnny Gibson he was a KIA a few weeks later after Swinger and <clears throat> that one of the nicest human beings you could ever imagine meeting and all he wanted to do when we had no duty no patrol or unloading or helicopters or filling sandbags, whatever the case would be, to reach into his hip pocket, pull out this big, thick, black wallet, open it up, and he would look at what I presumed was a picture for the longest time, and he'd get this big smile on his face. After 30 seconds or a minute, he'd look around for another soldier to show it to. And I watched him from a distance for weeks doing this. And I, at that point, didn't want to know anything about you. One day he managed to get up close to me, and he showed me that picture and asked me if, if, I, if he had showed me his wife and family yet. <clears throat> I said, yes, I've seen it, which was a lie. But for some reason, I took the wallet and looked at it, and I saw his beautiful young wife there, all dressed up. It looked like it was an Easter professional picture taken. And out on the end of her knees, there was this little baby girl, probably six, eight weeks old. 
and a little girl was in a light yellow dress looking over this way, and I presume she was looking at her daddy, and he was killed, and they're all bad if if you knew them and or served with them. There's, they're all equally a loss. But in this case, he was one of the few, maybe the only one that was married and had a child, and that just rips you up. And I didn't share that with anybody until a few years ago and down there at, with my wife and at the, at the VA. But I don't know how many times my mind has taken those two pictures out and showed me them over the years. They don't go away. And for people to think that they can send their young off to war, 18, 19, 20, 21, put them in those kind of situations and then bring them home and ask them, just forget about it, move on. That was then, this is now, is a bunch of crap. These things don't leave you. You learn to, su you learn to deal with them or, or survive with them, but they don't go away. And it, you have to deal with them or you go away, if you know what I mean. And that's, that's one of the true costs of war, just to put an emphasis on the combat aspect of things. Well, I want to ask, uh, what was your return to the United States like? I know uh, a lot of guys didn't get a warm welcome. What was your... I, I, I'll tell you two things. One, I've got at least two friends that were spit on when they came back. When, I, when we came back, like I was alluding to earlier, our plane landed there in the wee hours of the night at uh, McCord Air Force Base. We were given our uniforms. I think we had chow at some point there early that morning. It was dark. We told to get some sleep. And then the following morning, we were bussed into SeaTac, the international airport there, just uh, uh, east of Seattle, I believe, in there, the Tacoma area, whatever. And I, I remember walking into that terminal there, and it was so surreal. I had been in a combat zone, base camp, the 4th Infantry Division, in play coup just a little over 12 hours ago. You talk about a shock. And then I realized nobody was saying anything to me unless it was another soldier or unless I bought something from somebody, a sandwich, a Coke, whatever it might have been. On the plane ride from SeaTac to LAX, Los Angeles, I sat in the middle row on the left side of the fuselage, not a single human being in that plane, not a good American said a word to me, nobody. Nobody said anything at the terminal at LAX except another soldier or somebody I bought something from. I rode in the middle seat on the left side of the fuselage going to Phoenix. Nobody said a word except when I got home and my parents met me with a family friend there at LA, I mean at uh, Phoenix International. And uh, I, I've never forgot that. And I'm bitter to this day about that. If one person had just said, welcome home soldier, that would have meant so much. I didn't think about the parade the anti-war people like to say we all wanted. Never thought about it, never crossed my mind. But I was an American soldier coming home and putting my life on the line. And I knew hundreds of others, and nobody even had the time, no good American, to say, welcome home, soldier. You talk about being bitter. <laughs>